I'm very much aware that today, as far as the United States is concerned, is Mother's Day. And I do want to have some things to say about mothers, but I have reserved more specifically and in detail that sermon for this afternoon's worship. However, I want to do something a little different this morning concerning how I'm going to appeal to one particular mother of which we read in the New Testament to introduce really a study about the value of the church that Jesus built. I read at the time and right after the time that our Lord was about 12 years old and after he had been left in Jerusalem, parents went back to find him and he was there in the temple. He was studying with the doctors and asking them questions about the law, of course, and about things religious. And in verse 51, it says this, And he went down with them, that is his parents, and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Then it says this about his mother, according to the flesh, of course. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Have you ever thought about what all that meant? Truly, Joseph was not the fleshly father of Jesus, but he was the legal father and the one whom God in heaven, the spiritual father of Christ, placed over Christ while he was on this earth and in the family that Joseph headed. (coughs) Mary, of course, is the fleshly mother of Christ by whom genetically he received his body. John the Apostle, in writing about the Lord being born in this world, says, "And, and the Word became flesh. He became flesh because he was born of Mary, a virgin. She had to be, as well as Joseph, some very fine people. Now, what do I mean by fine? Well, there were so many things that they had to do, especially when it came to the little boy Jesus. She had a lot of things on her mind, a lot of sayings. Of course, when he said in the temple, when they found him, how is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? That's one of those things that she kept in her heart. Her heart being her inward man, her very soul. So she thought about these things. Mary was a thinker and a ponderer relative to all that she did. And I have no reason to believe that Joseph wasn't either. Think about it just for a moment and then we'll leave it. You see, they had all the dietary laws that the law of Moses required of them in order for them to be what they ought to be. And Jesus was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. You realize they had to so deal with him as a babe that he would never violate anything to do with the law of Moses when he was not old enough to make choices for himself. What kind of parents do you think they were? And she thought about these things. But there's another passage I'd like to link with this. Because she recognized that uh, he was far more than another Jewish boy. And a very good Jewish boy. We find at the time that Jesus began his earthly ministry. That he was in Cana of Galilee and at a wedding feast and you'll remember that he worked his first miracle there turning the water into wine have you ever noticed uh, Mary's involvement with this when you come to John chapter 2 you see in uh, verse 5 there's much we could say about this in the other verses but right here is where I want to go because of what the sermon really is all about After he had come there to the marriage feast, he works his first miracle. He turns the water into wine because they were without wine. And it was the custom that they would give the best grape juice first and then later give that which was not quite as good. And they ran out. So, notice that she says uh, they have no wine. Now you may think, because of the way we do things today and say things today, is a bit rude when he says, um, Woman... 
What have I to do with thee? Mine hour's not yet come. Uh, I suggest that you go back and understand things the way they understood it. For when he said woman like that was no disrespect for his mother. It was the way they addressed one another at that time. But notice the attitude of Mary in response to this. In verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That is a wealth of information about the viewpoint and attitude the mother of Jesus had toward her son. She realized that this is not a very brilliant, normal, human Jewish boy. Not a young man. He's about 30 years old this time. That, by the way, was when they considered a young man old enough to be on his own. Maybe that tells us a lot about what's wrong in this nation. But it may not. The point is, she had her viewpoint of him, and it wasn't this is my boy starting out on a great teaching trip. She knew he was. <coughs> and whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now let me ask you something. When you think of these things, when you think of Mother's Day, when you think about the fact that she was there at the cross watching all of that happen to one that she had the same attachment to as you do your children, but you understand the divine scheme of things is taking place. The only begotten Son of God whom I have had control of from the human standpoint all these years is far, far beyond just my Jewish son. And she was there at the cross witnessing all those things. Don't you know it was a burden on her? Jesus shows that in the very process of doing what he came to do, because he had taught to this end was I born, that he could do something in the process of discharging his duty to God and to mankind to save them and doing only what he could do from their sins, that he'd still take care of his mother. And he looked at John and he looked at her and he says, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. At least for a period of time, he said, John, I'm not going to be here any longer. Take care of mama. And mama, he'll take care of you. Now we know from the other scriptures that once he was raised from the dead, his own brothers and sisters believed on him and followed him. Two of the books of the Bible are written by half-brothers in the flesh, James and Jude. But we see that even while you carry out God's will, the very thing He came to do, without which man couldn't be saved, incidentally, because it took nothing away from Him completing that obedience to do it, He took care of His mother. That says a whole lot. More sometimes than we see in those words. But now when I begin to look around at the church, I, I see people saying, well, it's not worth anything. It's just sort of taken or left. Or it doesn't make any difference. But I would like for you to keep in mind what she said to the servants at the feast, the wedding feast in Cana, regarding committing things to His will to carry these things out like He sees fit. Whatsoever He tells you to do, do it. Now let me ask you something. Do you think that applies to the church. <clears throat> how would Mary think of people who say, oh, how much we love Jesus. Oh, how much we love the Word of God. But don't think very much, if anything at all, about the worth of the church. Now, if you're going to learn anything about anything spiritual as it has to do with salvation and Christianity, there is one Absolute, infallible authority. And that's the last will and testament of guess who? Jesus Christ. It's called the perfect, which means complete, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. 
And we're told over and over again, go back to the Word. Let things spiritual be formed in you by what is taught in the Bible. Well, the truth of the matter is, we've got a lot of folks that have one of these. But they don't know what's in it. They sort of do like a lot of people do. It's sort of an icon. If you've got one, it sort of rubs off on you. And you can talk about it. You can talk about the importance of it. You can talk about it being the communication of God to man. You can talk about it being the final revelation of God to man. The complete revelation of God to man. How we ought to follow it. How we ought to study it. But it reminds me one time of a tract I read about picking oranges in the Florida Grove and they would bring them in every year and they would talk about how to pick those oranges. How to identify the ones ready to be picked. All this stuff just have great comments and lectures by experienced pickers. Did a lot of talking. The oranges rotted and fell off the trees but they were learning the importance of how to pick them and how to identify them. So you see, you can have this Bible in your hand and you can talk about being the Word of God and the importance of it, how much you love it, and not know a thing in the world in it. Paul told Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto your wife. No, it doesn't read that way. Study to show thyself approved unto your husband. Study to show thyself approved unto your children, unto the federal government, unto whatever. No, it says study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Folks, that's a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Before God, because you claim it's the Bible, you don't know a thing about it. But I believe this. You know what most people mean when they say I believe? I think. But Bible belief comes by evidence contained in the word that you learned about when you studied it and handled it correctly about Jesus and how to be saved by Jesus and where, I say where, He saves those He saves from their sins and at what moment He saves them and how He did it. Now you're not going to learn that unless you read your Bible. You can listen to all sorts of preachers that have a lot of degrees at the end of their name. They dress well and they smell good. And they can smile at you and squeeze you and talk about how nice you are and great to see you. But they don't know about the Bible. The tapping under a stump out here. That's terrible news, but after all, the whole Bible's full of material that says some of the people that are most ignorant of the Bible are religious people. Let me ask you a question. Who put Jesus to death? Who cried out when the Roman Gentile Governor wanted to release him. Said, I don't find any fault in him. Who cried out? Crucify him, crucify him. It was the people who should have recognized him above all other people as the Messiah, the Son of God. Well, they put him to death. His blood be upon us and our children. You know, when you stand before God in judgment, and the standard of your judgment is the New Testament of Jesus Christ, don't you think you'd like to spend a whole lot more time with it? Because it's not going to change then from what it is now. It'll read the same way and be the same thing then as it means right now. So he's going to teach the same thing about the church then that he teaches about the church now. Well, don't you think we ought to follow Mary's advice? Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And when we think of mothers, would we want to think of what kind of mother she was and how she had to recognize what she did concerning her son. What about the kingdom? And who's king over the kingdom? You know, the Lord in promising to build His church in Matthew 16, 16 through 19, used the word kingdom and church interchangeably to refer to the institution of the saved. So the kingdom is the church. The church is the kingdom. Christ is over both of them. Jesus purchased the church with His blood, Acts 20 and 28. When you read of the crucifixion, and when we as Christians worshiping God commemorate His death in the way He told us to by observance of the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week in the worship assemblies, we do that because that's what He wants us to do. And You know, He said, if you love me, honk your horn. Didn't He say that? As far as I'm concerned, uh, when I read my Bible, I can understand it. He said, if you love me, 
keep my commandments. Those who have are pictured in the Bible as having washed their sins away. They washed them away in the blood of the Lamb. These are they that constitute the kingdom, Revelation 1 and 5. Thus those who are in the church, as I said, he used the word church and kingdom interchangeably when he talked about building that institution wherein would be the saved. (coughs) Then I find that he gave thanks to God, that is, Paul did, in writing to the church at Colossae in Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, Do you think Mary would want us to understand that about the church and the kingdom? Jesus couldn't be a king without a kingdom. On the day the church started, the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as Luke records in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up with the other apostles and is proclaiming the gospel in its fullness for the first time. In the process of doing that, Peter quoted David to show that Jesus at that very time was reigning at the right hand of God, was king. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath, Peter said, an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, Acts 2, 30-31. Now, if you take the king... Away from the kingdom, and both's not going to stand. They're going to fall. If you take the kingdom away from the king, both will fall. Christ reigns as king over his kingdom, but that kingdom is the church, the one he promised to build in Matthew 16, 18. That's just the right division of the word. Will you accept the word? Mary said, whatever he saith to you, do it. Will you? Then what about the church as the kingdom being the body, the spiritual body of Christ with our Lord himself being the head? God gave Christ Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. You can just see Mary standing over here when the Apostle Paul by... The infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit wrote those words in a letter to the church in Ephesus, making up part of the New Testament, which we have today, saying, are they going to, are they going to hear Him? And will they do it? Colossians 1.18, to the church of Colossae, Paul penned, and He, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. Well, folks, the body of Christ is the church of Christ, is the kingdom of Christ. We learn that from the New Testament of Christ. Paul stated he was willing to suffer the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Colossians 1.24 Will you receive with meekness the engrafted word like Mary said, whatsoever he tells you, do it? Now let me ask, is the church related to Christ? It is his body, and he is its head, its only head, has only one head, you know, you don't really need one head. Uh, the little kid would run if you came in here with two heads. In fact, I would be ahead of them running. This is not a zombie apocalypse. Christ is the building. Christ is the builder of the building. When we speak of the body as uh, the church as the body, then that's the spiritual body of Christ. To be in Christ is to be in His body. That's why He added the saved of the church, Acts 2.47. And they were saved when they heard the word. Faith was produced in them, Romans 10.17. And they repented of their sins because that's what Paul, or rather Peter, inspired the Holy Spirit, told them to do. And they were baptized for the remission of their sins. Do you believe the word of God? Are you going to listen to some preacher? Or what somebody else says. And here's the thing about it. Do you have enough interest to go open up this New Testament? Read it for yourself. Don't depend on me. Just read it for yourself. I don't think you can get any clearer than Paul to the church in Ephesus when he says there's one body and there's one Lord. How difficult is that to understand? There's one body. There's one Lord. I don't think you can get any clearer. 
Now, I, I think that we all know what happens when you separate the head from the body. The head functions through the body. But the body must have its head function. And Islam seems to know that because they tend to separate heads from bodies to keep the bodies from functioning. I say again, nobody needs two heads. It's, it, it takes only one head to function. Now, do you see the relationship that Jesus in His own Word gives us when it comes to the church and its head? Will you receive it? Now, whether you do or you don't, it will change it, what it says in the Bible. But Mary is still sitting there listening. Do they really love my son? If they do, then listen to Mary. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Now, is this the last will and testament of Jesus Christ? Is this where you find His will? Is this where you learn from God how to be saved? Where God saves? When God saves? Those people on the day of Pentecost, the day the church started, were added to the church by the Lord Himself. Acts 2 in verse 47. These are they who heard that word, believed on Christ by the evidence contained in that word preached, were commanded to repent of their sins and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's, if you'd never heard of David Brown and you had a Bible, that's the way it would read in your Bible. We need to understand these things. What about the bride and the bridegroom? In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 through 32, Paul does a tremendous job as the Spirit writes through him part of the will of Christ infallibly guiding him to paint a graphic picture of, of Christ and the church. And he uses a figure of, of a groom and a bride. And, and notice some of these statements and realize it's in words that we learn the ideas and thoughts of God. In other words, the will of God is in the Word of God. You can't find the will of God outside the Word of God. If you want to know the will of God, you have to go to the Word of God. He says in verse 23 of Ephesians 5, For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. Then he says also in verse number 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And after, having, uh, after showing how the bride should be pure, members of the church should be faithful, Paul concluded this in this way. I speak concerning Christ and the church, verse 32. And that's where he was heading all along and using this analogy. I think that's revealing. We begin to see the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church even clearer. And by the way, Mary's still over here saying, Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. And that's regarding our viewpoints of the church or anything else religiously. But in Romans 7, 4, Paul wrote, Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Thus the church is pictured as being married to Christ. Now what do you learn about that? You learn about it from the New Testament of Christ. The church is his bride. But again, the inspired apostle wrote, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Now you know you just can't have a bridegroom without a bride. The church is the bride of Christ. Now is... Our Lord's bride, non-essential. Oh, Mary still moved over here now and she's saying, Whatsoever, whatsoever He saith unto thee, do it. I'd say that's a pretty good mother and an example for all mothers to follow. What about the building and the builder? We can learn a lot about that analogy, that is about the church by that analogy, 
Remember, Jesus said upon this rock, that is, that He is the Son of God, I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. Is that a worthless building? Did Jesus build a worthless building? I'm not willing to declare that the church Jesus promised to build is worthless. It's built upon the foundation of Christ Himself. Listen to what Paul again said to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. Then I find too to the church in Corinth and Achaia and Greece, he said in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. <coughs> now, you don't learn that from just people. You see, it's in your Bible. When you leave here today, open up the Word of God, let God speak to you, and remember those words of Mary. That good mother whom God put His Son under and brought Him into the world by. Whatsoever He saith unto you, do it. If the building is not essential, I tell you the foundation is not essential. The church is the building. Christ is the builder and the foundation. Now let me ask you, how essential is the church that Jesus built? All of this is said about it, but it doesn't make any difference about it. In Ephesians 5.25, Paul declared to the church concerning the purchase and the price paid, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. But the church didn't make any difference. God doesn't really care about the church. All you got to do is think about Christ and you're a sinner and Christ will save you and forget about the church. When people say that, I know when I say it, as nice as I know how, they just don't know their Bible. And they're not taking the time to let the Bible form their view of the church. They're listening to what feels good to them. Paul instructed elders to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. Well, it sounds like to me, Jesus paid something, a whole lot of something, for a worthless institution. You see, if the church costs the blood of Christ, but the church is worthless, what does that say about the money paid for it? Are you willing to say, oh, the blood of Christ is not worth a thing? Well, you wouldn't say that, would you? But you would say, the church makes no difference to the salvation of anybody. But Christ purchased the church with His blood. Is not the purchase price what it ought to be? And did God not know what He was doing? This is the price Jesus paid for the church. I don't think He was defrauded. Those who teach at the church that the blood of Christ purchased is not essential, are actually by implication making Christ the victim of the most ruthless confidence job the world's ever known. They would have you believe that Jesus purchased what I think we still understand to be worthless when we call it a gold brick. But Christ paid the price for something of equal value and the church was just as dear to him as his own precious blood which he suffered and bled and shed to purchase now Mary's moved back there but you know she's still saying the same thing whatsoever he saith unto thee do it well should I believe what Jesus said in his last will and testament or should I believe a bunch of preachers and a bunch of people who claim to be the teachers of righteousness, but when I open my Bible and I read it for myself, if I'd never heard of this church you're sitting in the worship assembly of now, what would it say? But what about, and then we'll make the lesson yours and have to do with it as you will. What about then the question, is the church essential or having anything to do with my salvation from sins and getting me to heaven? Folks, the Lord put every person that was baptized in Christ for the remission of sins and thus He saved for the remission of their sins, he put them in the church. I don't think sometimes we realize that the church is also the family of God. And when we say, well, God has children in all these families. Do you need to know what you said? It may characterize a lot of men nowadays as where their children are and how many different families. But don't ever assign that to God. God has his children in his own family. Paul said to Timothy 
If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. Folks, every child of God, every Christian is in God's family. God does not have children in all sorts of families. It just simply goes back to the wrong concept people have about the church and the nature of it. We need to form our views of Christ, of God, of the Bible, and certainly of salvation and when we're saved and how God saves us through Christ and of the church by what the Bible says. Is it something wrong with me when I said the Bible that you have? Won't you study it and follow it? So if you take away the body of Christ, you're taking away the church, you're taking away the family of God, you're destroying the head who has authority over the body. If you take away the bride, you don't have Jesus as the bridegroom. If you take away the building, you destroy the work of the builder and you render its foundation useless. If you take away the kingdom, you cannot have Christ as king because you can't have a kingdom without a king. That's the reason it's a kingdom. If you take away the church purchased by the blood, then the blood is no value for all Christ's blood went into the purchase price of his church that he promised to build. Now we're quickly rushing to the day of our demise unless the Lord comes back first. Either way, there'll be a tremendous transition from the flesh and material things and time into a realm that is not governed by any of that. And the Lord said, you've got time on this earth to learn my truth, live according to it, sacrifice whatever is necessary of your likes and dislikes, your family or whatever, to be obedient to me. And if you'll love me and keep my commandments and be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the Lord, mind you. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. For it's in the Lord where he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, the forgiveness of sins and sonship being one of those spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Then when the Lord comes back and you stand all by your lonesome before that judgment seat, the book will be opened. It'll read just like it does now regarding salvation in the church. And you'll be able to say, I've done what you asked me to do. Mary is standing there with the rest of us, by the way. And will she look at us and say, I was telling you all along whatsoever he bid you do, do it. Did you do it? Jesus is saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The writer of Hebrews said that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Now don't you think that we need to learn what's in this book instead of just saying, look at me, I have a Bible. Well, what's in it? I have a Bible. But what's in it? See, Holy Bible? That makes me holy. I'm holy here next to my heart. Learn what's in this book. Put it into practice. You'll go to heaven. No doubt about it. Because Jesus is going to say on the day of judgment to those who have done his will. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. But he also said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Our lives on earth and the flesh is meant to be used to prepare to meet our God. If we do not prepare properly to meet our God according to the last will and testament of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have flunked the schoolroom of life. And we'll here depart from me. I never knew you into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. I don't want to hear that. I don't think anybody in the right mind wants to hear that thing. Because once you're there, you're there. There's no hope. In other words, you're there. Well, yeah, but what about tomorrow? There is no tomorrow. You're there, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, but won't there be an ending to all that? No, there, this is, there's no end. It's just that way. Because you didn't use your life to find God, learn the truth, and live it. And yet we all can. How far is your Bible away from you that you can pick it up and study it and learn for yourself what God says for you to do? Most of the world won't do it. The great majority of people will not do it. And the great majority of religious people will not follow the Bible, the Bible only. For the Bible and the Bible only, right and divided, makes Christians and Christians only. 
And that's what I want to be. I, I don't want to be a hyphenated Christian. I just want to be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that Jesus built, to which He added me when I obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is His power to save me from sin. Romans 1, verse 16. That's why it must be preached to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Therein is where God's located His power to save. So I ask anybody today who's a member of the church or not, don't you want to appreciate the church more? And don't you want to follow that mother of long ago that the Scriptures recorded at the first miracle Jesus gave uh, that He did when she said to the servants, whatever He bid you do, do it. I close this lesson saying the same thing. Whatever He bids you do, do it. If you're a child of God, you've wandered by sin. You need to repent of those sins and God's second law pardon. Come confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. We'll pray with you and for you and God's promise to forgive you. Are you subject to the great invitation of Christ? If so, we beg you come while we stand and sing.